Good morning. <laughs> you know, I do these kind of speeches from time to time, and, and when you are in the speaking business, there is a dirty little secret. And the dirty little secret is that it depends when you speak. <laughs> and among us speakers, there is one speaking slot that we dread, absolutely dread. It's called the graveyard shift. And it is after the gala event the next morning. <laughs> but you are such a great audience, so this is not going to be a graveyard shift. This is going to be fantastic. So let's get through the formalities first and quickly. This is my Twitter handle just in case you want to contact me. Looking into the crystal ball, if we take a crystal ball and look into the future, can we do that? Why are we looking into the future? The famous American poem that says, count yourself happy not to know how the future will be bent, because knowledge killed many and left the rest indifferent. So why are we looking into the crystal ball? Why are we doing this? We're not doing it just for curiosity, just because we want to find out what's going to happen. We're doing it because we want to inform ourselves. Because every single day we face a decision. Not just one, but dozens of them. And because we face decisions, we need to make choices. We need to choose, but which way? And the hope is, as we see a little clearer into the future, we can make better decisions. We can choose the right path going forward. So the crystal ball is not just because of curiosity. The crystal ball is there because we want to take the right path, the path that leads us to our goal. And this is where data comes in. But let me explain with an example that probably most of you are familiar with. It has to do with this, the flu virus. Every year, the flu, the so-called seasonal flu, kills tens of thousands of people around the world. But in 2009, you might remember, there was a new flu virus that was detected, the so-called H1N1 virus. And there was no vaccine available, and so health authorities around the world feared that it might kill millions of people, like in the early 20th century. So, because there was no vaccine available, the best that health authorities could do at that time was to try to limit and slow down the spread of the flu. But for that, you needed to know where it actually was. Now, health authorities have mechanisms for that. For example, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta and the United States are the health authorities for the United States. And, and what they do is that they have thousands and thousands of doctors out there in the US. And they have requested that each and every of those doctors give the CDCs a call to tell them when they have a new flu case. And out of that data, the CDC works day and night, and then does statistical analysis, and then knows with a high degree of likelihood where the flu was two weeks ago, which is completely useless when you have a potentially deadly pandemic at your hands. Just around the same time, in 2009, engineers at an internet company that you're all familiar with had a very different idea. Their idea was to predict the spread of the flu by just looking at the search requests that Google receives. So the idea was to take the search requests and to take the flu data and to see whether there was a correlation. Now, Google has a lot of that data, that search request data, 
because people search through Google a lot. Google receives about 5 billion search requests every single day. And Google has saved every single one of them, including where they came from and when they arrived, for the last 15 years. So they have a lot of data available, and they can do the correlations. They ran 450 million different mathematical models. But then they found one that predicts with a high degree of likelihood the onset of the flu just by looking at search requests. Here are the official data of the CDC and the Google predictions. And you see, it's quite amazing. But what is interesting about this is that were the CDCs take two weeks, Google has the insight in real time. That is not precisely big data yet, but it is showing the perspective. Now, you'll probably look at me and say, come on, Maya Schoenberg, haven't we looked at data for ages? That's right. We human beings make sense of the world around us by observing it. That's how we operate. And we collect data intuitively all the time. But at the same time, for thousands and thousands of years, we also intuitively understood that observing, collecting data that way is really hard and time consuming and therefore costly. And so we have collected and analyzed as little data as absolutely necessary in order to answer the questions that we had. In other words, because of our inability to deal with data, we have designed the methods, the organizations, the institutions, the structures of making sense of this world based on the assumption that very little data is available. What if that changes? What if that world of small data changes because of our ability to collect and analyze data? We'll find out relatively soon because that's just what's happening. See, it started maybe about 15 years ago in the natural sciences. Take, take astronomy, for example. When in the year 2000, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a telescope, came on stream, it collected more data in its first couple of weeks of operations than had been collected in the entire history of astronomy. In the last 15 years, this one telescope collected 210 terabytes of astronomy data. Next year, a follow-on telescope, here is a rendering, will come on stream. That will collect the, this amount of data, 210 terabytes, every five days. Or take our human genome, our DNA. In April of 2003, the world celebrated a huge achievement. We had sequenced one human being's DNA in full. Three billion base pairs. One DNA completely sequenced. It took us 10 years, one billion dollars, a global research effort. But then we had it. But it was only for one person. Fast forward. 15 years later, I can go and have my DNA completely sequenced in one day for $1,000. And what you get is the data of 3 billion base pairs of DNA, of me. It's not just that the sciences are full of data. Companies, particularly the internet companies, generate and collect a lot of data as well. For example, there are 500 million tweets a day, and you'll probably contribute to some of them. There is over a billion YouTube users that upload five hours of video every single second. So even if you stop sleeping, you would never be able to watch the videos that are uploaded from now on. 10 million photographs and more uploaded to Facebook every single hour, and Google processes dozens of petabytes of data every single day. Petabytes? Petabytes? 
Petabytes. What did you have for breakfast? A couple of petabytes? How much is a petabyte of data? See, if you take a book, collect uh, a typical book, 250 pages, and you then have all the data, all the letters and the graphs in a book, take that amount of data. And then you take not just one book, but all the books in the library. And you don't just take one average library, but the largest library in the world, the American Library of Congress. And then you add in all of the newspaper and magazine holdings and the music holdings that that library has to 60,000 subscriptions to newspapers, by the way. Add all of that in. Then you have a petabyte if you multiply it by 100. And Google processes dozens of them every single day. Now, if we look at the total amount of data that we have in the world, the best guesstimate that we have is that from 1987 to 2007, the amount of data in the world grew 100-fold, 100 times. Elizabeth Eisenstein, a historian, says that if we want to go back in human history, when the, was the last time that that happened, we have to go back all the way to 1455 to 1505, when in these 50 years, thanks to the Gutenberg printing press revolution, the amount of data in the world doubled in 50 years. Here we have 100 times the data in 20 years. Now, the Gutenberg revolution caused all kinds of things, the Reformation, the 30-year war, Ooh. Very interesting. What is this going to do? But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is denoted by these two different colors here. There is this light pink color that denotes analog storage. The, the dark violet, um, the dark purple color is digital storage. Now, if you go to, say, the year 2000, which is right this white line here, if you go to the year 2000, which is not so long ago, I remember the year 2000. Well, actually, that may tell you more about my age than anything else. But at the year 2000, we have had three quarters of the data in the world being analog. Three quarters. Today, analog is less than 1%. So within 15 years, we have moved from an analog world to a digital world. And that has huge repercussions because digital data is eminently easier to collect, to store, and to analyze. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the hope is that the additional quantity turns into a new quality. Let's take an example, a metaphor from photography. See, if you take a picture of a rider on a horse, then what you have is a picture of a rider on a horse. But if you increase the quantity of it, let's say by taking a picture every second of a rider on a horse, then what you get is a lot more pictures of a rider on a horse. <laughs> but let's add more quantity and take 16 pictures per second of a rider on a horse. Then suddenly that additional quantity begins to translate into a new quality. In that case, moving pictures. And the hope is we could do the same thing with more data. More in that sense means not just that we have more absolute data points available. No, no, that's irrelevant. What really counts is whether we capture not just a small sample of the data, but whether we capture capture close to all of a particular phenomenon. If we do that, then everything <laughs> changes. Now, let me explain how and why using photography again. See, I'm going to take a picture of you now using my smartphone. Please smile. Everyone, back there, please. OK, thank you very much. Now, I've taken a picture, and I had to make a very important choice. The choice is, 
who do I focus on? Do I focus on the nice lady in the second row or the gentleman in the seventh row? If I focus on you, sorry, you're going to be blurred back there. And the problem is, if I've done this, it's too late to change it. If I later on look at the picture and I find out I actually would like to take a closer look at the gentleman, I can't. He's blurred. The data isn't there. In other words, with photography and with small data analysis, we need to know exactly what kind of question we want to answer before we begin to collect the data. If we don't, we run the risk of collecting the wrong thing. Much like a photograph. Here you have a photograph of a toothbrush in the front. In the back, out of focus, you have my then three-year-old son. I can't put him back into focus. Too late. Photo's taken, right? Too bad. My wife's not very happy about that. <laughs> Except, this is not a normal photograph. This photograph has been taken with a new kind of camera called a big data camera, or light field or lightro camera. And this captures not just one focal pane, but all focal pane and all light rays. And what this does is it creates huge files. And when you look at the file, I can just click on my son, and he comes into focus. Or I can click on the toothbrush, and it comes into focus. Because all the data is there, questions that I didn't even think I wanted to ask can be answered. And that is precisely the promise of big data. See, let me give you an example from an actual company that you're familiar with called Walmart. Walmart collects all kinds of transaction data about, about what people buy and when. And their big data analytics team looked at it, and they discovered that just before a hurricane hits a Walmart location, people rush to the Walmart and they buy batteries and flashlights. I could have told them that. But then they also discovered that people rush to the Walmart and they buy Pop-Tarts. <laughs> Pop-Tarts is an American sugary snack. Please note that I don't call it food that is available at Walmarts. And it's not just any Pop-Tarts that they buy, it's Strawberry. So the team looked at it and said, why? Why are they doing this? Is this because they want to eat the Pop-Tarts and hope that some of the gases may dissipate the hurricane? Or is this because if the electricity goes out, then we have some sugary snack to nibble on? Until one of the team said, stop it. The data doesn't tell us. It's just correlations. The data does not tell us what. That does not tell us why. The data only tells us what. It can't give us the cause. It can only tell us what's happening. But that is good enough. And the others in the team said, yes, indeed. And so when today a hurricane is approaching to a Walmart location, the store manager goes to the back and takes the Pop-Tarts to the front <laughs> so that even more can be sold. Now, you look at this and you may say, ah, oh, Meyer Schoenberger, come on. You are only giving us the marketing application of big data. Well, actually, that's not, not true because my next example is about a particularly vulnerable group of human beings and very, very important decisions about life and death. Big data is now being used to help a group of vulnerable human beings called preemies or premature babies like this one. Dr. Carolyn McGregor and her team at the University of Ontario in Canada has an idea, or had an idea. She gave these babies digital sensors that were measuring the vital signs of the baby, like blood oxygenation level, blood pressure, and so forth, in real time. She's collecting, for each baby, 1,200 data points of health data per second. 
and doing that over hours and days and weeks and over dozens and dozens of babies. And then she's looking at the data, trying to find a pattern in the vital signs that predict with a high degree of likelihood the onset of a future infection. And she was able to find that pattern. So today they are able to predict 24 hours before first symptoms manifest themselves just by the changes in the vital signs that the baby will have an infection. Now, that saves the lives of the baby because medication can be given earlier, but the kickers are really first, that Dr. Carolyn McGregor does not know why, only what. Second, that in this particular case, the pattern that predicted with a high degree of likelihood the onset of an infection is not as everybody would have expected it, that the vital signs go crazy. The pattern that is the best predictor is that within a second, the vital signs suddenly stabilize. Now, if you ask any pediatrician out there, he would have said or she would have said, if the vital signs stabilize, baby's doing well. Actually, for preemies, not. And my third point, Dr. Carolyn McGregor, the star of my story, Dr. Carolyn McGregor, the healer of the babies in a way, or the protector of the babies. Dr. Carolyn McGregor, not a medical doctor, computer scientist. So what this does give us is a new perspective on reality, and therefore a much better, much improved capacity that we have to predict, like whether or not the baby gets an infection. But for that to work, of course, those that do it need data. And they rely on our ability to transfer ever more aspects of our, of our life as, uh, into data. We call that datafication. Now, location today is datafied. See, I come from a generation where relationships ended because we couldn't find the hotel in the new city that we drove into. When I tell this story to my students, they say, What's wrong? Didn't you have a sat-nav? And the answer is no, we didn't. <laughs> more and more gets datafied. In, the, um, in Japan, a research team is even datafying human posture, that is, human behinds. With 30 sensors, they measure your behind. Now, why would they do this? First, don't ever ask researchers that question. But secondly, they do this because they are thinking about an anti-theft device for cars. You get into your car, your bum is measured, you're identified, you can drive off. Thief gets into the car, bum is measured, bum's too big, car doesn't work. <laughs> That's being datafied now. And you are all familiar with the first version of Google Glass. Now, the first version doesn't do, I think, what Google Glass, what Google wants Google Glass to do, and na namely that is to datafy the human gaze. Can you imagine how valuable it would be to know what people are looking at, what street sign, what advertisement sign they are looking at, what shopping window they are looking at, what men are looking when they walk down the street? We know that, cars. <laughs> and then we take all of that data and transfer it into value, particularly economic value. And see, the point in the past was that we had small data, our inability to collect data at large scale, and therefore we collected data only for a particular purpose, used it for that purpose, and then threw it out. In the future, we will reuse data over and over and over again for different purposes. And that changes the whole game. See, data, we will understand, is like an iceberg, where most of the value is underneath the waterline and can only be reaped as we are reusing it. One example is a company called Price Stats out of MIT. And what they do is they go out on the internet every single day, and they go to Amazon, and they go to eBay, and to many other e-commerce sites, and they download, scrape, all the price data of all the consumer products. And they do that sometimes every 15 minutes. What do they do with that? Make inflation predictions in real time. And they were able to see the deflationary moment in the financial crisis 2008 before everybody else was seeing it. 
or some of you may be wearing a fitness device like a jawbone. Now, what this captures is how often you walk and run and do all these kind of things, and the data is uploaded and you can compete with each other. But last year, the company that does the jawbones saw something very remarkable. This was um, a time when, in California, there was an earthquake. And it was a night, during the night. And because it was so strong, a lot of people woke up during the night in an earthquake. That waking up was captured by the jawbone. And in fact, when they looked at the data, this is activity data, and it goes down as we go to 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 a.m., 3 a.m., and then at 3.25, the earthquake hits, and boom, the activity goes up because everybody wakes up. But because they know where the people were, they could then measure the severity of the earthquake at different locations. And it turns out that this company now has a network of seismographs much more dispersed and much bigger than any agency of government in the world. It's valuable data. Or take the startup company Duolingo that helps people learn languages. It's free. If you haven't used it, go out. It's really fun to use it. Every single day, dozens of millions of people around the world learn a foreign language using Duolingo. It's really cool. But you know what? The Duolingo folks looked at the data because there are so many people that learn the language, they, and they record, the app records when they make a mistake and what kind of mistake they make. They understand how people learn the language. And so they discovered, for instance, that Spanish speakers learn English the wrong way. And if you resequence some of the lessons, then the success rate is significantly improved. Now, why does this insight not come from linguistic professors at the University of Oxford? Are they too stupid? No, I hope not. They don't have the data. They only have data of 30, 40 poor students that they employ. Duolingo has dozens of millions, if you want, guinea pigs out there. And that enables them and many others to take data and to transfer it into insight. And that means change. Change is coming. And change is coming really fast. But because it is change, a lot of people don't like it. Because it's hard. And a lot of people will say, please, let's stay on the trail. Let's stick to small data. Let's not go off the path that we already are familiar with. But you have to. See, Royce Royce not the luxury car company, but the second largest jet engine producer in the world, had this lesson told to them and experienced themselves. When they developed the engine for the Airbus 380, they not only put all the sensors and the computers in there to capture a lot of data about the engine so that the engine can be managed very well during the flight, but they also captured the data so that when the engine lands, the data can be sent back to Royce Royce headquarters. Three gigabytes of data per engine per flight. Hundreds and hundreds of engines, then they looked at the patterns. And they were now able to predict with a high degree of likelihood when a part in the engine breaks before it actually breaks. Which is great news for everyone, including the passengers. But for Rolls Royce, it was superb news because it enabled them to move from a company that sells products to a company that sells maintenance services at fixed cost. And within 10 years, they changed their entire business model, and they now derive more than 50% of the revenues from services. Or there is a telecom company in the Netherlands that has discovered that the signal strengths of the cell towers change depending on the local weather around it. So they discovered that they have thousands and thousands of real-time weather stations out there, and they are now thinking about going into weather forecasting. A new business model, change. What we will happen and what we will see in the big data era is the demise of a change-resistant company. If you cannot change, you're going to be dead. You're going to go out of business. But it's not just at the company level. It's below that, too. See, there's a story about the 41 shades of blue. A few years back, the chief designer at Google was asked to design and to pick a color for a line at the search screen. And he picked a particular blue. 
his boss said, why this blue and not another blue? And he said, because I am the chief designer. And his boss said, prove it. And he said, I don't prove things. You have to trust me. Or do you want me to resign? And his boss said, resignation accepted. <laughs> and then they tested 41 different shades of blue and found out that a blue that was slightly different than the one that the designer picked created $15 million more revenues per quarter. It was, the boss said, one of her best decisions at Google. That boss was Marissa Meyer, now runs Yahoo. What this means is that the self-styled experts in companies that we all are so familiar with, usually like me, older men, are on the demise. If they are not able to change, if they are not able to see what's happening. Now, what does that mean for your role? Because you are not just connected inward inside the company, you're connected outward to the company, to the rest of the world. It means that you may have a new role to play. That is, use the data to anticipate change and to propagate change in your company. Your company will be enormously grateful for that, although it's not an easy task to do. Target is an American supermarket company, and their data analysis of transaction data tells them with a high degree of likelihood whether and when one of their customers is pregnant. Sometimes even before the women know themselves. <laughs> now, when you are sort of laughing, but only <laughs> a little bit, then that's right. This conjures up images of a surveillance society that George Orwell described in 1984, and, and the NSA revelations haven't helped. But that's just one problem. The other problem is that we begin to predict human behavior in the future and then hold people responsible not for what they have done, but what they're going to do. If you think of Minority Report now, that's precisely the direction that that might be going to. And so, what does this mean? It means that all the people out there, the customers, the wider public, that needs to volunteer to give data will only give data if they can trust. If they tune out, if they distrust the entire sector, if they distrust a particular company, the game is over. Trust is fundamentally important. And trust comes by taking on responsibility. And so trust comes with responsibility. Responsibility produces trust. Without trust, trust to the wider public, there can be no big data. And so trust and responsibilities are going to be the currencies of sustainable growth in this big data era. A study in the United States has shown that a car of the color orange has the least repair cost. Half of you are already thinking, oh, this must be because uh, the drivers are more careful. Oh, this must be because an orange car is more visible at night. Stop it, guys. Stop it. The data does not tell us why. The data only tells us what. And the moment you imbue data with more meaning than it actually has, giving it some causal insights that you can't get out of it, you expose yourself to the dictatorship of data. And as you do that, you are misusing data and you're leading yourself down the wrong path. So let me conclude, where does this lead us to? Big data is going to change the way we make decisions. It's gonna improve our ability to make better decisions, in part by much improved predictions. So that we understand where our company is going to be headed, where our next success might be, how to better communicate with an audience and how our cars drive themselves. But it's also important that this powerful tool is used by its masters 
us and not the other way around. That as it is vital to learn from big data, we also need to make sure that we carve out a space for the human, for the things that the prediction cannot do and the data cannot show, originality and creativity, irrationality, and sometimes behaving against what the prediction suggests. Because at the end of the day, the data is just a reflection of reality, not reality itself, and therefore always incomplete, always imperfect. And so I ask you, let's walk into this big data era with a lot of humility and a lot of humanity. Thank you.